Discussion on Ablation Index to Guide AF Ablation Ablation index is used in the context of pulmonary vein isolation with radio frequency catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. Pulmonary vein reconnection is an important problem which reduces the long-term success rate of AF ablation. Other studies have shown that force sensing is important in AF ablation and optimal results are obtained when 90% or more of the lesions receive a local force of more than 10 grams and the time in contact force range exceeds 80%. Durability of pulmonary vein isolation depends on full thickness gap-free ablation. When the gaps exceed 10 mm, there is increase in the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Ablation index is a quality marker which includes contact force and contact time in a weighted formula. High rates of persistent pulmonary vein isolation and avoidance of recurrence of arrhythmia in patients with persistent AF was documented in the PRAISE study. 95% of patients were in sinus rhythm at one year. Target values of ablation index were 550 for anterior and 400 for the posterior left atrial regions. Protocol mandated two month re-study in the PRAISE study noted pulmonary vein reconnection in 22% of patients affecting 7% of pulmonary veins. In 44% of patients, ablation on the interpulmonary venous carina was required to achieve durable pulmonary vein isolation. Among the 20% of patients who had recurrence of atrial tachyarrhythmia, only one had pulmonary vein reconnection at the repeat study. At 12 months, 95% of patients were in sinus rhythm with 10% patients having started antiarrhythmic drugs. Significant factors associated with recurrence were high body mass index and excess alcohol consumption. Vein of Marshall is a tributary of the coronary sinus with abundant sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. It has been implicated in the genesis and maintenance of atrial fibrillation. Three reasons described are the myocardial extensions into the structure, node-like remnants within the vein and the rich autonomic innervation surrounding it. It is anatomically related to the mitral isthmus. Mitral isthmus is the region between the left inferior pulmonary vein ostium and the mitral annulus. Oblique vein of Marshall is the residua of the embryonic left superior cardinal vein. Though pulmonary vein isolation is effective in the treatment of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the role in persistent atrial fibrillation is suboptimal. A common form of ablation failure is recurrence as perimitral flutter. Vein of Marshall is in the re-entrant circuit of perimitral flutter and vein of Marshall ablation can abolish perimitral flutter. Effect on sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation is another important aspect of vein of Marshall ablation. Venous trial enrolled patients undergoing their first catheter ablation for AF, while Mars AF enrolled patients undergoing ablation after previous ablation failure. Both were National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute funded randomized controlled trials. The trials were to test the safety and efficacy of vein of Marshall ethanol infusion added to pulmonary vein isolation in patients undergoing either de novo ablation of persistent AF or after a previous ablation failure. Venus trial was a single blinded trial conducted at 12 centers in the United States. 158 patients were assigned to catheter ablation alone and 185 patients to combine catheter ablation with vein of Marshall ethanol infusion. Higher number of patients were randomized to vein of Marshall ethanol infusion to accommodate for the possibility of 15% technical failure. Vein of Marshall procedure was done prior to catheter ablation. Vein of Marshall was identified by coronary sinus venography. If the vein of Marshall was present, 
the vein was cannulated with an angioplasty wire and over the wire balloon. Ethanol infusion was given distilled to an inflated balloon. A bolus injection can reach the left atrium. 1 ml of 98% ethanol was delivered over 2 minutes. Up to 4 infusions from distal to proximal were given depending on the size of vein of Marshall. After ethanol injection, a repeat voltage map was obtained to identify the ethanol induced scar. Vein of Marshall ethanol infusion was successfully delivered in 155 of the 185 patients. Freedom from AF or atrial tachycardia was 49.2% in vein of Marshall plus catheter ablation group versus 38% in catheter ablation alone group. The assessment was based on absence of these events on monitoring at 6 months and 12 months. Mars AF trial did not show significant benefit in those with previous failed AF ablation. There were 80 patients across 11 centers in this trial. Discussion on Ashman Phenomenon in Atrial Fibrillation Ashman Phenomenon is a form of aberrancy which was described in 1947. It is aberrancy due to the change in refractory period with varying cycle length. The refractory period increases with increase in preceding cycle length and vice versa. Hence, if a short cycle follows a long cycle, aberrancy can result. The aberrancy is usually of right bundle branch type because refractory period of right bundle is more than that of left bundle branch. Aberrancy can be maintained in subsequent beads due to a concealed transeptal conduction which keeps the right bundle branch refractory. This rather fast sequence of wide QRS complexes in the setting of atrial fibrillation mimic a run of ventricular tachycardia, but the differentiating features are the initiating long shot sequence and the irregularity in RR interval during the tachycardia. Recognition of Ashman phenomenon in a strip of AF can be clinically important. If the person is on digoxin, occurrence of Ashman phenomenon does not call for dose reduction, but if it is ventricular ectopy, dose reduction is needed as it could be due to digoxin toxicity. Same applies in a more sinister way to a run of white QRS complex tachycardia. Fish has proposed a few criteria for the diagnosis of Ashman phenomenon. 1. Long short sequence terminating in the white QRS. Occasionally, a reverse sequence has also been reported. Though RBBB aberrancy is more common, LBBB aberrancy can also occur. 2. RBBB aberrancy as a normal initial QRS vector. 3. Varying coupling intervals of the aberrant QRS complexes. 4. Full compensatory pause is not seen as the underlying rhythm is atrial fibrillation. Richard Ashman was a physiologist at Louisiana State University School of Medicine in New Orleans. Here are a few references on Ashman phenomenon. Adenosine is widely used in the termination of supraventricular tachycardia. One of the initial reports of atrial fibrillation induced by adenosine was by Silverman and Associates in 1996. They described five patients who developed AF after adenosine administration. None of these patients had structural heart disease and only one had prior history of AF. Adenosine was given during electrophysiological study in these patients with SVT to block AV conduction to unmask any potential axillary pathway. Hence, the administration was during sinus rhythm and not during SVT. Four of them developed AV block prior to AF, while the remaining patient had accessory pathway conduction. They proposed that the shortening of atrial action potential by the action of adenosine on its receptors in atrial myocytes is the mechanism for induction of AF. They also highlighted the potential risk of AF with fast ventricular rate in case it is precipitated while treating SVT mediated by an accessory pathway. Prior to this report, Belhassen and Associates had reported induction of AF by ATP. Strickberger and colleagues noted 12% incidence of AF when 12 mg adenosine was given through the femoral vein for SVT during an EP study.
the mean ventricular response in AF was similar in this study for those with AVNRT and AVRT and was modest. The maximum pre-excited heart rate was 214 per minute. They propose that shortening of atrial action potential duration is a possible mechanism for induction of AF. In addition, they noted frequent atrial ectopics which would have contributed to precipitation of AF by the long short sequence mechanism. Adenosine induced AF has been reported by Israel and colleagues as well. Lee and associates used optical mapping and immunoblot mapping of atria to evaluate the mechanism of adenosine induced AF in explanted human hearts. They noted higher A1 receptor expression in right atria. G protein coupled inwardly rectifying potassium channels activated by A1 receptors were considered to be involved in maintaining reentrant drivers in lateral part of right atrium. First set of references on adenosine induced AF. Second set of references on adenosine induced AF. Discussion on causes of regular RR interval in atrial fibrillation. ECG in atrial fibrillation is characterized by absent P waves, presence of fibrillary waves or F waves, and a totally irregular RR interval. But regular RR interval in atrial fibrillation can occur if there is associated 1. Complete AV block 2. Ventricular tachycardia 3. AV junctional tachycardia 4. AV nodal ablation followed by permanent pacemaker implantation In all these conditions, regular RR interval in atrial fibrillation occurs because the ventricles are controlled by a different rhythm not dependent on the irregularly conducted atrial signals of atrial fibrillation AV node ablation with permanent ventricular pacemaker implantation is usually considered when the ventricular rate in AF is high despite optimal medications. In one study, significant improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction, quality of life and activity scores was documented after discontinuing rate controlling medications, AV node ablation and pacemaker implantation. The Ablet and PACE trial also had documented similar improvements. Sometimes there can be an apparent regularity when the ventricular rate in atrial fibrillation is low as those on digoxin or beta blockers. But close scrutiny will reveal the subtle irregularity in RR intervals. Digoxin toxicity can cause complete heart block and regular RR intervals due to the subsidiary pacemaker in atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation with paroxysmal AV junctional tachycardia can also cause complete AV dissociation and regular ventricular rhythm in digoxin toxicity. Here are a few important journal references on the topic. Discussion on CHADS2 and chads was scoring system for atrial fibrillation. CHADS2 score was developed to assess the risk of thromboembolism in non valvular atrial fibrillation. Scores were allotted to various risk factors as follows. Congestive heart failure 1, history of hypertension 1, age above 75 years 1, diabetes 1, stroke or TIA 2. Anticoagulation, typically warfarin, is indicated when charge 2 score is 2 or more. That would mean that anyone who had a stroke or TIA along with atrial fibrillation will need lifelong anticoagulation. As age above 75 is a risk factor, any one of hypertension, diabetes mellitus or congestive heart failure in this age group will become an indication for anticoagulation in the presence of atrial fibrillation. Valvar atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation in the presence of mitral stenosis or artificial heart valves. Other valvular lesions like mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis and regurgitation do not result in low flow in left atrium. In valvar AF, only vitamin K dependent oral anticoagulants are considered, while in non valvar AF, non vitamin K dependent oral anticoagulants can also be considered. Chad's VASC is another risk factor based point scoring system for AF and is meant for assessing the risk of thromboembolism in non valvar AF. Major risk factors are given a score of 2 points each.
other clinically relevant non major risk factors are given one point each points for each category are as follows congestive heart failure or left ventricular dysfunction 1 hypertension 1 age 75 or more 2 diabetes mellitus 1 stroke tia or thromboembolism 2 vascular disease 1 age 65 to 74 1 sex category female sex 1 maximum score possible 9 chats was score is an improvement from the chats 2 score the risk increases as the score increases from 0 to 9 in a study involving over 7300 patients stroke rate was 0 when the score was 0 though there was only one patient in that category There were 14 patients with a score of 9 and they had a stroke rate of 15.2%. Maximum number of patients had scores of 3 and 4 with 1730 and 1718 patients in these categories. Score 3 had a stroke rate of 3.2% and score 4 had a stroke rate of 4%. Discussion on charge A of risk score to predict the risk of atrial fibrillation. The derivation cohort for the development of the charge A of risk score combined participants of three community-based studies from the United States of America: Framingham Heart Study, Cardiovascular Health Study, and Atherosclerosis Risk in Communities Study or ERIC. The validation cohort comprised of two European studies. age study and the rotterdam study charge af risk score used multiple variables and gave them weightages age was taken per 5 year increment height per 10 cm increment weight per 15 kg increment systolic blood pressure per 20 mm of mercury increment and diastolic blood pressure per 10 mm of mercury increment other factors were smoking use of antihypertensive medication diabetes heart failure and myocardial infarction calculation of the actual charge af score is rather tough as shown in this slide the weightage coefficients were derived from the derivation cohorts charge af score has been shown to predict af better than charge 2 was score it may be noted that though charge 2 was score was developed for prediction of stroke in atrial fibrillation it has also been used to predict risk of atrial fibrillation here are a couple of references on charge af score discussion on complex fractionated atrial electrograms complex fractionated atrial electrograms were offered as a tool for substrate mapping and ablation in atrial fibrillation by nadimani and colleagues in 2004 but there is a lack of consensus on the definition of cfae as well as the definite role in ablation of atrial fibrillation complex fractionated atrial electrograms may be found at areas of slow conduction pivot point of turning wavelets wave collision fibrillary conduction rotor meandering as well as due to autonomic activation but all cfaes may not be the driver source for atrial fibrillation This has an important implication in that searching for and ablating all CFA locations may be time consuming and produce unnecessary atrial scarring or even atrial mechanical dysfunction. Moreover, temporal variability of CFA locations have also been described questioning the utility of CFA mapping. Narayan and colleagues have classified CFA into four types. using monophasic action potentials type 1 cfa with rapid regular and pan systolic activation type 2 acceleration dependent cfa both contributing 8% each type 3 cfa due to non local or far field electrogram detection which appears to be the commonest variety 67% type 4 cfa without discrete monophasic action potential and disorganized atrial fibrillation which constituted 17% it may be noted that cfa due to far field signals may not be ideal ablation sites the star af2 trial evaluated three strategies for ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation
the strategies were pulmonary vein isolation, pulmonary vein isolation plus CFA ablation, and pulmonary vein isolation plus linear lesions. The study randomized 589 patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. Procedure time was significantly shorter for pulmonary vein isolation alone as expected. After 18 months, the percentage of patients free of recurrent atrial fibrillation in the three groups were 59%, 49% and 46% respectively. But the difference was not statistically significant. Another smaller study randomized 92 patients with persistent atrial fibrillation to pulmonary vein isolation plus ablation of CFAE or pulmonary vein isolation plus additional linear ablation across the left atrial roof and mitral valve isthmus. Follow-up was longer for a period of 5 years. At 12 months follow-up, AF recurrence rates were 21% and 23% respectively. At a mean follow-up of 59 plus minus 36 months, the figures were 44.6% and 48.3% respectively which was not a statistically significant difference. Authors concluded that among patients with persistent AF, there was no difference in maintenance of sinus rhythm between CFA ablation or linear ablation performed in addition to pulmonary vein isolation either in short term or long term follow up. Left ventricular diastolic function assessment by echo in atrial fibrillation. Conventionally, left ventricular diastolic function assessment by echocardiography relies on mitral inflow velocity measurement with demonstration of E by A reversal as an evidence of diastolic dysfunction. In atrial fibrillation, the absence of atrial contraction and the A wave makes this conventional assessment impossible. Moreover, the variation in the cardiac cycle also causes beat to beat changes in ventricular relaxation. A variety of other parameters have been reported to be useful in assessing diastolic function and left ventricular filling pressures by echocardiography in the presence of atrial fibrillation. They include mitral E-wave deceleration time, ratio of mitral E-wave to tissue Doppler derived mitral annular E-prime, color mode derived VP, early diastolic flow propagation velocity, and the ratio of mitral E-wave to VP. Peak pulmonary vein diastolic flow velocity, pulmonary vein diastolic wave deceleration time, Peak acceleration time of the mitral E-wave, isovolumetric relaxation time and the ratio of isovolumetric relaxation time to the time between the onsets of mitral E-wave and the mitral annular E-prime wave. Flow propagation velocity VP on color M mode is measured as the slope of the first color aliasing velocity from the mitral annulus in early diastole to 4 cm distally into the left ventricular cavity. A dual Doppler technique has been described for simultaneous measurement of E and E prime so that the ratio E by E prime can be calculated in the same beat itself. This avoids the beat to beat variation of these values in AF which would compound a non simultaneous measurement. Short of this novel technique, any measurement in atrial fibrillation would need averaging of values for 5 to 10 cardiac cycles. Mitral diastolic E wave deceleration time of less than 100 milliseconds correlates with the pulmonary wedge pressure of more than 18 millimeters of mercury. Deceleration time is the duration between the peak of the E wave and the upper deceleration slope extrapolated to the baseline. It is usually measured from the apical four chamber view. Pulmonary vein diastolic wave deceleration time is also measured in a similar way from the right upper pulmonary vein 
in the apical four chamber view. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe, like, share and post your valuable comment below this video. Kindly press the bell icon after that for getting all updates.